Welcome back to the Final Corner Podcast, where we have happily survived the heat wave of 2022. Nick and Tom, how are you feeling? Melty. I'm loving life because it's quite cold here now. But, <laughs> but yesterday was a near death experience. Yes, not not the most pleasant conditions. Um, no. But we've how made it. Oh, fantastic! Uh, it's currently 28 degrees where I'm sitting at the moment. Ooh. Sunny Scotland. <laughs> can I, can I be doing this? Can't be doing this. It reminds me of Silverstone last year. It was like 33 Oof. degrees every day, which was horrible. But we've all survived, and we're a week late, but we're going to review the Austrian Grand Prix in advance of Paul Ricard this weekend, and also not kill, but it's two cars back this weekend. So we're going to nice. jump back a week to the Red Bull Ring in Austria, where the Orange Army were out in force. Smoke flares mm. everywhere. Couldn't see a bomb and thing. But a uh, relative, it was a quite enjoyable race, I thought. The sprint was a non-event, but the, the race was okay. Yeah, I enjoyed that. It was a good event. Yeah, because of the mixed strategies at the front and mm. some actual overtaking, it was yes. enjoyable as a whole for me as well. Yeah, it's always a good track, Austria, because you guarantee that at least some incidents down into like turn four. Mm-hmm. Like it's yeah. whatever whatever car design you're going to get, some incidents down there, and we got that again. It's it's not so normal do. Yeah. So no real news going into the weekend. I think the no real thing was the FIA technical checks on all the cars have been delayed again till Spa, I believe. Yeah. Oh dear. So everyone gets another couple of races with their flexi fours and all the all the nonsense that they're doing. I would also say there was a small bit of news on the weekend itself where there were reports of sexual harassment. Mm. I was glad that the FIA and Formula One uh, denounced what was going on and made a statement, but let's hope that doesn't carry on anywhere ever again. Yeah, completely. Yeah, there was, there was hundreds of reports of people coming out having horrendous experiences. Yeah, that's far worse than the boo gate. So mm. ig- ignore oh, booing someone. Uh, that's also been a big debate. This is far more serious. Yeah, I mean, there's new fans coming to F1, but it doesn't need to be new behaviour. Exactly. When you're, when yeah. you're accommodating your fans and that, that's not acceptable anywhere at any sport. Not something you ever hear about, really, with um, motorsport or Formula One, which is a shame that it cropped up here. But yeah, hopefully that was... Uh, not to be repeated again, like we say, and then there was onto a, a good race. Mm, yeah, it was interesting. I was watching back the Hamilton and Rosberg fight where the, they crashed on the last lap, <laughs> and it was interesting watching the replay and seeing how full the grandstands were then compared to now. And it's just night and day. Yeah, the the tendencies at F one, which is great, but mm. there's that also that other side that can't happen. Correct. Yeah. But I think also as well, one thing is that people just point to the Netflix show. Mm. And I think that's a big factor. But I also think it's not the only factor. Because I think, I think I might have mentioned it before, but there's what, like five, six video games that have officially licensed Formula One content now? So that's mm-hmm. getting a younger audience. Uh, there's also the much improved social media and YouTube presence. Uh, there's also things like Max Verstappen becoming a national icon. So yeah. His, you know, th- that country was obviously clearly very much into the motorsport, and then now they had a Formula One champion or driver winning races in, in that series as well. That that sort of ignited that nation. So then that might not that might have happened without Netflix, right? Yeah. I also think esports as well with the whole pandemic where motor racing stopped, a lot of people started watching the esports and then moved back yep. onto the real motorsports. Yeah, that's a good factor as well, and that gets your younger audience in as well on the whole, mm. on average. So there's several different things here. Plus the extended TV coverage. You don't know what TV deals are in each nation, right? Which might help. Yeah, plus the Dutch commentators are mental, as we've heard from... Ha! <laughs> Ziggo spot! Yeah, from we've dipped into the replays and interviews. I've not seen that. But I've seen no. when they do uh, post-race interviews, they seem to ask the most brutal questions, don't they? Yeah. They like, they're like spinning a yarn. Yeah, there's no filters in the want a story. Yeah. Whereas Sky's pretty nice and nicey most of the yeah. time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And controversy on track as well helps. Final point, I guess. You know, the title battle last year. Yeah. 
gets everybody interested. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So on a qualifying, which is Friday night, and I forgot about it. Yep, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Friday night qualifying. That's, That's the best thing about the sprint format for me. I'm sure it was great. I forgot about it. So I, I seen the result on my phone as I was walking around Tesco, and I was like, oh, no. What's happened here? <laughs> so, Vettel being rubbish. Vettel being rubbish. <clears throat> yeah. Stroll being rubbish. Ricardo being rubbish. And uh, Yeah, what's that about? Both Mercedes putting it on the wall. Yeah. That's um, the big thing. Yeah. yeah, well, Lewis through turn seven and eight got a good big gusty wind apparently, which sent him into the barrier. And then Russell binned it out of the final corner, which I still have not seen a reason why that happened. Or if he just binned it himself or if it was a problem. I think they're just both pushing hard. Yeah. Over the limit. But now they've got something a bit more to fight for. I think maybe they were just trying that a bit, bit too much. And that's fine by me. Yeah. You, want to, you want to try to see people push them to the limit. They they might be thinking, oh, we've got a chance of at least pipping Perez or something. Which would have been amazing, but anyway, it didn't work out. They were definitely in the fight for the top four this weekend oh, yeah. on pace. So that was a, that was a big well, it was a big shame that that didn't happen. But Max managed to take pole, which was great. And then we had an interest in... Situation with Sergio Perez where he didn't. Everyone was getting a lap delayed for going a millimeter off track. Hmm. He he goes well off track, gets his lap, gets through to Q three, and then after the session, they but they chuck him out. So it's actually it. rubbish, that isn't it? Because you are denying someone else to go into Q three. Yeah, I think it was Gasly. Yeah, think. and then you never know if they you know, they might not have, Gasly might not have finished uh, tenth. He might have finished eighth or ninth. Mm. Yeah, uh, and also, uh, yeah, these decisions. I think this happened before uh, last year or the year before, and Kevin Magnussen lost his mind because <laughs> it could have been him going to the next session. Yeah, and it didn't um, work out. The penalty came too late. Similar scenario here. When in between Q one and Q two, if there is any question of doubt over track limits, I suppose they can't pause the next session because of TV schedules and stuff like this. But. Uh, no, it has but to be looked at in that immediacy. Everyone yeah. else was losing the laps instantly. Was that at different going. corners though? It That's was. the thing. It's because that corner was not being monitored. But if it's not being monitored, then monitor it. Monitor it. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah, it's a weird one. I believe that there was some kind of uh, complaint from another team. Is what triggered it. I mean, he's straight over the line there. So if you're, mm. if you, I don't think it's any in any doubt if the track limits are broken or not. There to me. Mm-hmm. And the timing is very frustrate- frustrating. It just took far too long to come to the decision. And if you've already started the next qualifying session, you might as well just let it go. Well, it's uh, not uh, rel- Yeah, relegated Perez down to 13th after all that. Both Hassies in the top 10, as was both Alpines. Mm. And yeah, it was it was cool to see Max take the pole position. Or, or no, not pole position, fastest lap, I think they call it. So I think they're giving pole to the sprint this year. Uh, no, no, no. Other way around. Other way around. Oh, God. Right, yeah. you took pole position then. Mm-hmm. <sighs> You're trying to wrap your head around it, but no. It's only been a year. <laughs> well, they did change it this year, so it's, it's yeah. forgiven. Yeah. But it also meant that Hamilton's ninth, so probably should have been higher up uh, because of his incident. Yeah. And the Mercedes team had a busy evening. Yes, definitely. The, the Russell one, you think, oh, is that going to be hit? Oh, yeah, and it's actually quite significant. And yeah, oh, it affected his whole weekend after that, didn't it? Because they didn't have a spare rear wing of the same spec, so he had to run a higher downforce rear wing than they wanted to. Very good point. I'd forgotten about that. And then uh, the Hamilton one, this is when the whole controversy came up about everybody was booing or cheering or something everyone the crowd was very happy that he'd crashed basically and he was he said something like he shouldn't be doing that because i could be injured uh yeah it uh, wasn't one of those crashes where everyone's like oh i hope he's okay exactly it, it, it didn't look like a massive impact so i don't really see a problem with it it's just a pantomime element of sport really 
I think so, yeah. I know you almost want to see a bit of emotion from the fans, provided it's mm. in the right way. Obviously, yeah. not like the allegations that we already mentioned, and not where it's like yeah. sometimes in football where you can see them swearing and make his hand signals behind the player when they're scoring in slow motion on TV. And it's, <laughs> it's before the watershed and stuff. But some emotion's good, and it it was obvious to me that it wasn't um, a big hit. It wasn't Kubica or um, Canada, was yeah. it? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, it'd be a bit different if the guy was getting lifted out of the car and you were cheating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, on his sprint, which I did remember a bit, <laughs> Alonso didn't make the start at all. Um, Technical issue. Yeah. Yeah. And Joe didn't make it back round to his good spot either on the formation lap, which had but an he... aborted start. Mm-hmm. So, two aborted starts, wasn't it? Uh, because it was the first yeah. aborted as well, yeah. I think because well, Alonso wasn't he on the grid. And he was on the grid move. with tire blankets on, so they couldn't. Yeah, I think they had to wheel him into the pits after that. Yeah, I'm not sure if that aborted the first. Either, either way, there was at least one because Joe came to a mm. grinding halt coming out the final corner, didn't he? Mm. And yeah, it went round again. Did he? Did he start? Where did he start, actually start from then? Pit lane. Um, pit lane. Yeah. Ah, right. Okay. Because he managed to get it going, but because you've uh, lost your. If you fall to the back of the pack, you have to start from the pit lane. I see. Max managed to keep the lead for turn one. Sainz tried to go around the outside of turn three, but ran deep. And that allowed Leclerc down the inside to turn four and take second off of his teammate. Which, again, an opportunity for Sainz and he makes a little mistake, which mm. caused some the weekend, really. Ah... Uh. He's uh, just running a little deep there, but it's also a really weird line that he's trying. Mm. It's not like the traditional go around the out. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what he's trying to do there. He's trying to get an extra amazing run down the next straight, I think. Yeah. But he gets a bit sideways on the exit. And that, that means his teammates all over him like a rash. Yeah, just a clumsy one. There was contact at the start, though, between Hamilton and Gasly, which was nearly identical to the Joe crash from Silverstone. That's Pierre. true, actually. Yeah. Mm. This time it was Pierre edging over on the right hand side. Hamilton was in the middle. Pierre gets launched in the air and drops to the back, but he's able to keep going. Lucky for but all three drivers that were close there that they were able to continue. Yeah. Yeah, there's not much you can do. You can only ask drivers to be stop moving about at the start. Yeah. I mean, none of them can see. They always say they can't see anything at the start in the mirror, so they're what can you do apart from telling it to hold the line? Yeah, I suppose the only other thing you could have is spotters, but I don't think that really works. No. I think it's just two unfortunate racing incidents. Mm-hmm. Hamilton uh, dropped back at the start, but managed to get past Albon at turn one, which opened up the door for Norris to try and go around outside the turn three. He gets nudged out wide, and instant five-second penalty for Alex Albon. Now, when you say nudged, do they actually make contact? No. No. Oh, I couldn't help but think that that was a harsh penalty. Yeah. Considering what happened at the last race at Silverstone, suddenly, as soon as mm. I saw that incident, I was like, they're going to give a penalty and it's going to be the complete opposite for what we had last week. Last week, you could run anybody wide at any point. Yeah. Slight exaggeration, but it certainly, um, oh, what's the corner that's also in touring cars that... that Everybody run wide, everybody wide off the circuit there. And I'm wondering, is it because technically his front wing wasn't ahead at that point? But it is at several times through that process, I think. Hmm. Norris is on his, like, ah. Uh, that to me is not, you can't, if you start giving out penalties for that, how, I don't understand how people are supposed to defend. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those things, I think it was a bit harsh on Norris. It is. Being sort of pushed out there, but. but not five seconds harsh. No, exactly. Norris yeah. could have backed out if he wanted to. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to do anything, maybe sort of like a black and white flag. Let's just say, mind what you're doing. But... I'm fully on board with that, yeah. Yeah. So Norris got past him, I'm sure, like a lap or two later. He did, yeah. It was mm-hmm. huge yeah. lasting damage either. Well, yeah. that was also quite frustrating, I thought, because there was... Uh, on the timing screen, you could see the two were swapping positions about three or four times, mm. and none of it was shown at all. They were just showing cars going around the track with no interest happening. Weird one. Yeah. yeah. Trying to trying to 
and make everybody forget that they've given a harsh penalty by not showing them on track again. <laughs> Probably. It's just the inconsistency that drives me up the wall, and it's apparently driving all the drivers up mm-hmm. the wall as well. Yeah. Vettel, I think, stormed out the drivers' meeting on Friday <laughs> night and got himself a 15 grand fine or something. Oh, yeah. But, what was he angry about? Yes. Because uh, it was half an hour in the meeting, I think, and the meeting hadn't started because they're all arguing about Stewart still. Uh, uh, oh, Alonso as well, I believe, wasn't there? An Alonso hmm. monologue where he complains about a penalty he got a few races back and he's going to keep complaining about it whenever something else happens. That's oh, man. man. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's still raging about the... Is it, it was a Canada penalty, but he was yeah. weaving because he wanted was to get the same penalty last but, week. But he deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> he totally did. Yeah. He's just here for the wind up, Fernando, these days. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, well, he he's, knows he can't win a race, so he's a bit bored, I think. Yeah, maybe next year. Oh, well, my prediction is still he's going to win one this year. But You know what I mean, though? He's not fighting for the title, so he's like, oh, oh yeah. let's just push all everybody's buttons. Yeah. Actually, he did something in this race, but we'll come to it later. <laughs> so... Lap 7, Sainz tried to get around outside to Leclerc at turn 4, but Leclerc shut the door on him. Now, we all know we can't go around the outside of this corner, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, just get that set up now. Good. Yeah. He had a very compliant driver and a lot of luck to make it mm-hmm. happen. Um, <laughs> Magnus and Schumacher are no Citeo, uh, which was Perez to nick up to 8 because he's recovering. Vettel then tried to go around outside the Albon at turn 5. Or six, six, seven, six. Ah, it's, it's, six because, it's six because the kink is five. Yes, middle of the track. <laughs> yes. So he tries to go around the outside, turn six, but Albon tags him and sends him flying into the gravel. Oh, uh, yeah, which I, I thought was a racing incident as well. Mm. Yep, same. It's a hard track to go around the outside on. Yes. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. Did you see Vettel reversing out the gravel? Thought that was yeah, that was clever. Yeah. I yeah. mean, Albon has a, a little wiggle, doesn't he? Which is unfortunate in the middle of the corner. Yeah. But ah, you, you don't have to give everything, every time someone blinks, it doesn't have to be a penalty. That's my opinion. Mm-hmm. I know that one driver's uh, race is then, oh, sorry, sprint is then effectively ruined. But again, I don't think, I don't, of the two Albon moves, that one's more deserving of a penalty, but. Still thought it was a bit I, harsh. Yeah, I would agree, but I, I just don't think it's a penalty either. Did he get a penalty for it? Yep. Mm, did he? I don't remember him getting one, did he? Oh, man. Well, if he didn't, that's embarrassing. I know he got <laughs> the one for the, the first one. I don't remember. Definitely the one got the, the first one, but yeah, I wasn't sure about the second. Uh, in my mind, he did. He did. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he got his penalty for this one. That's fine. Uh, Hamlin's trying to cover, but he's stuck behind the Haas cars. Uh, I thought it was quite clever for a little while because Mick was getting the DRS off the back of mm-hmm. Magnussen, and then they came on the radio and asked Magnussen to give him the DRS. And all of a sudden, Magnussen went half a signal up quicker and went out of range. Yeah, which I thought might have been a bit petty if it was over it. I think he was doing that anyway. I, I thought quite often that he was pulling away, and then he was always a little bit closer, just coming up to the DRS zones. Hmm. Which I thought was quite clever if he was doing it before he was told to. Yeah, but it seems like when he was told to, he wasn't doing the <laughs> yeah. backing off part anymore. Exactly. <laughs> Which eventually allowed uh, Hamilton up to eighth and take the last point. And Just with two laps spare as well, so the whole DRS tactic could have paid off better. I think Mick could have probably held him off with that, mm. maybe. I don't know. Yeah, and Mick was angry as well because he wanted to let past Magnussen and the team wouldn't let him. Yeah. Hmm. But what was strange about the weekend is that it looked like Verstappen had this in the bag and after the sprint I was like, yeah, well we know what the race is going to be. Mm-hmm. But the Ferraris were really confident after the race, after the sprint, which is weird. And everyone was commenting how weird that was, but yeah, as it turns cause... out they must have been looking at the tire deck and went, we've got this. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. Because the, there was a sizable gap to Max. Mm-hmm. And, but they also tripped over each other. Yeah. yeah, but it never looked like Leclerc could catch him. But it turns out he probably could have caught him in the sprint. He just didn't want to. So, any more in the sprint? There was one thing I spotted that I thought was quite interesting: is that when Lewis passed Bottas, 
thought is that the first time in years that he's passed Bottas without being ordered by the team? Have <laughs> <laughs> him let through? Probably, probably since the Williams days for yeah. Bottas. Yeah. But now, apart from that, on his Sunday then for the race, and it was even at the front at the start, but Russell managed to get alongside Sainz for turn one. Ferrari ran wide and managed to keep the position. Whoa, whoa! I'm going to have to interrupt you there. Mm. I mean, run wide, oh yeah, it's an accurate description, but to me, <laughs> science deliberately uses a, the MotoGP long lap penalty to gain or keep hold of a position. Yeah, And we're talking about track pe- track limits and stuff here, but apparently you can do whatever you want on lap one, which I know Alonso set the precedent in Russia, mm-hmm. was it? Last year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, science has clearly taken heed of that. Yeah. It was actually quite annoying, that move, I thought, by science. I, I was with you on that. I thought, it's fair enough he's gone wide, and it's fair enough he can keep going quickly yeah you but can't use it to keep a position which is what i know russell was the, past him but he then used the extra speed from running out wide to get past him again that's what it looked like yeah it's the, it's the only reason he kept that position mm-hmm. it, it keeps it pinned straight over the rolex sign and that little extra asphalt for the bikes it's a joke or as alonzo yeah. would say it's a yoke <laughs> gamma yeah yeah you've got to keep it pinned though yeah, <laughs> on brand. Yeah, uh, yeah, I did think that was a bit touch and go as well. But uh, the, then it compromised Russell when it turned three. Yeah, totally. Yep. Which allowed Perez to go on the outside on the run down to turn four, and then we got the standard Red Bull Mercedes crash <laughs> <laughs> turn four. Perez tries to go on the outside of Russell. It's contact with his rear right wheel, and he spins off. Russell gets wing damage. George gets a five second penalty, which I thought was really harsh because mm-hmm. Same. he was on the inside curb on the way in. It was as far right as he could go. He wasn't drifting right out to the side of the track, and Perez had an extra card to he could have used. Also, there's no uh, like mid corner oversteer like the Albon and Vettel one, which I incorrectly said was a penalty, but wasn't. We'll ignore that. But <laughs> I'd, if you watch that replay, I was I find myself thinking. What else could George Russell do to avoid that impact? Mm-hmm. And I couldn't think of anything. Well, the president seems to be at that corner. Then you've got to slam on the brakes and let the guy go around outside of you. Yeah, yeah, that's the only thing. The cars behind you slamming into the back of you as well. Mm. Pull over and stop, please, George. Mm. There's nothing. He doesn't hasn't done anything wrong. He's kept to the right side. He's wobbled slightly over that curb on the inside, but he's only on that curb because there's a Red Bull turning. I think that's crap. And I think, mm-hmm. uh, obviously, Perez's full race was affected, wasn't it? Because didn't he pick up four damage from the gravel gravel rash? Yeah. But that sh- <sighs> there's no way that's a penalty. Anyway, as we come to, he recovers well, does Russell. But... Yeah, he has to pack for a new front line as well, which puts him right at the back. Which is already, he's already had a penalty in that case. Mm-hmm. You know, in a way, yeah. naturalistically, he's had a penalty. Yeah. I mean, that one, I didn't... There's other there's another instant late in the race where the guy on the inside deserves a penalty. But this one, I, I thought that was really, really harsh. So we see Mike Schumacher overtaking Lewis Hamilton, which is a bit, a bit an odd sight. And then uh, Hamilton's commenting how quick the Hasses are in the streets. And he's sort of stuck for a while until yeah. he, he starts calling back on them, I think, just due to tire degradation. But on the streets... No match for the Hasses. It's, it's the setup of the Mercedes, I think, more than anything. Mm. That it's quite high downforce or quite draggy. Mm. Must be the latter. Although no Mercedes car engine car is particularly flying at the minute, is it? No. No. But yeah, I don't think it's a huge difference between the engines, definitely. I think it's some kind of setup issue. But yeah, I agree. Lap 12, and we get a move for the lead. Leclerc catches Mac snapping down at turn four and manages to squeeze his way up the inside, which I thought was a really nice opportunistic move. Lovely move. I thought it was one of the best overta- the overtaking move of the year because it's DRS assisted, but the actual mm-hmm. overtake is dive bomb on the brakes when Max is yeah. half asleep. And that doesn't happen often. You know. You never rarely catch Max napping when it comes to racecraft. It can be very forceful and mm-hmm. aggressive too much, perhaps, in recent years. But he's left the door open. 
And, and yeah. it's, it's just totally. odd. It's rare to see an outbreaking maneuver in this fashion in Formula One, and I love it. Yeah, mm. I did as well. It's like old school Daniel Ricciardo. Well done, Charles. <laughs> yeah, well done. Max's tyres are knackered, basically. So I think he pits well before anyone else. I think he'll pits on lap 17, so a couple laps after he loses the lead. It was the following lap, actually. Yeah, oh, 14. 14, yeah. 14. Mm-hmm. Or 13, end of 13, whatever. <laughs> so his tyres are knackered. And, yeah, you see why Ferrari were so confident. Just the Red Bulls just mm. chewing them up. Uh, Lewis then managed to get Schumacher up and say he turned seven, which is a nice move. I love an overtaking through that corner. Yeah, You don't see that either. You don't see late dives in Formula 1, really, like the Charles move. And uh, when was the last time you see a move on to seven? Mm. I think that's where the new regulations are helping. Oh, good in, point. Yeah. In a better position to run close through the um, corner before that. Mm. Yep. And actually get into that position there. I thought it was cover as well, because it's a part of the track which negates the Hassi top speed. Like yes. he, he wasn't able to get it done in a turn three or four at all, but he managed to keep close and just stick his nose up the inside. And he must have been yeah. thinking about that all through the sprint. Mm. Yeah, and where learned, else can I learned from guys? it. Yeah, yeah. So that was my that was my move of the race. That that caught me Oof. by surprise. It was good. Uh, fair play. He then got Magnussen pretty easily after that. Got P four on the road. Uh, we get a nice midfield scrap. Alonso's pressure on Joe, but he gets a crappy exit at the last corner, which gives Magnussen a sniff. Magnussen goes up inside of both of them into turn one. <laughs> uh, Alonso gets up inside of Joe, who just parks his car on the outside and waves everyone through. Yeah, gets out as a cup of tea. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> it's so weird. Yeah. I think we were discussing this before we started recording. I don't know what he's trying to do it down into the first corner there. <laughs> Like he's got a good four car lengths, and I don't know if it's to do with the DRS line um, just before the Nicky Lauda curve. But anyway, he's doing something weird. So two cars go down the inside of him, and then, but then on the next straight, he didn't didn't get the DRS. No. So there's mm. four cars around him that, that all do. So yeah, that's that yeah. position over with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but him backing off, he's allowed. Uh, I think a Haas and Norris to close up the back of him as well. So there's a five car fight down at turn three. Yeah. yeah, which it was is lovely like, to watch. Oh, it was brilliant. It was like go karts. It was great. <laughs> and Norris manages to get around the the free cars. Yeah. So he goes up to eighth and then Magnus and gets him back down and they turn four to take eight of back. But which was, was a late brilliant. dive as well. I enjoyed that because uh, arguably mm. Norris has got the full car ahead with the DRS, but Magnuson's having none of it. And yeah. I like. I enjoy a, a fight back without, um, you know, just oh, they've got DRS, fresher tires, they go past. No, he's he's had a dive again. But mm. I feel I felt sorry for Joe. Maybe that's a bit. It's just a bit too trepidatious, wasn't it? It was just a bit like, oh no, there's two cars on the inside. I'm just gonna slow the right way down and then get mugged with no <laughs> DRS. It was, it was unfortunate. Yeah, and you can't blame him really after what happened at the last race for him. He that could be on his mind. He doesn't want to get into any real wheel to wheel combat. Good point, but also four positions in one in two corners. <laughs> yeah, three yeah. corners if you count the kink. <laughs> Which, we <laughs> Which we don't. Which no, we don't. <laughs> It'd be interesting if they ever did the MotoGP. I know they won't, but what difference yeah. that makes to racing having those little? It's like a little Z shape on the street, isn't it? Yeah, have you seen mm. it? No, yeah, because of the yeah. Formula One. Yeah, it's um. Well, all my experience from watching the MotoGP race, the, the reason it's there is that that fast kink on a bike is like a corner, if that yeah. makes sense. And there was this awful incident. Was it last mm. season? Oh, with the bike flying. Yeah. And so, because if you if you get a wiggle through there, you have a crash at basically top speed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but the chicane's awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does look good. It's really bad. Uh, so, but I mean, I'd rather that than incident. I'm not sure. I think it might be too narrow for cars. That's my opinion mm. on that. But you're right. I'd love to see an alternative layout. Maybe they should do a touring car race with it or something. Yeah, it's very narrow through it. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. Thing they probably have, would never do it, but it'd be quite interesting to see what having on our breaking point near would do. Yeah, let's have the sprint on that layout and the main race on the other. <laughs> yeah. I'd prefer that. We could do that yeah, at Secure next yeah. year. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. 
So, uh, Leclerc pits from the lead, drops behind Max, but then easily retakes it on lap 33. Max has waved him past at that point, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, can I just say, before this point, somewhere in the pit stop shuffle, Max is behind Lewis, and Lewis is defending, even mm-hmm. though he's off strategy. I thought that was quite interesting. That certainly gave yeah. the crowd something to boo about. Because <laughs> uh, there was no advantage f- f- to Lewis to do that. But it maybe it's a psychological thing of, you know, just, just yeah. wait until I get a good car. Hmm. Or just wait till Paul Ricard if all the speculations to be believed. Oh, I don't buy into that. <laughs> <laughs> if they're quicker, there'll be two, it'll still be a half a second gap. Well, it's to be something like 36 degrees as well this weekend at Paul Ricard, which is going to be crazy. You might get the pavement melting. Or asphalt, so yeah. as you call it. Yeah, well, no, pavement could be fine as well, yeah. Pavement and asphalt, say, you just can't well, use the word gonna, tarmac. Yeah, I was going to say tarmac, but that's why pavement popped in my head. I was like, I can't oh. say that. It'll melt, it'll be like a psychedelic playground, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that'd I be see, weird. I've seen in Paris, they've got their big gorilla statues and everything up in preparation <laughs> for it. God. So, uh, the temperatures went down a bit, so I'm going to be 32 on Sunday now. Yeah, on the week it's it's supposed to be about thirty six, thirty seven. That's, that's still warm, but yeah, the thing with the uh, mm. get too excited about the forecast is that it can change within a day. So yeah, yeah, this is that what's happened. So uh, Schumacher then overtakes Magnussen in the penultimate corner, which I don't know if it was a coordinated one, but scripted. If not, yeah, well done. <laughs> then we get then we get a turn four crash that deserves a penalty. Where uh, Vettel tries to go around outside the Gasly, and yeah, Pierre's not making. Well, he's running right out to the outside of the corner while a car's there or not, mm-hmm. and a yeah. car's there. So poor Seb gets wiped out for the second time at the weekend. Well, I think uh, does it deserve a penalty? Gasly's on the lock stops, isn't he? And he is running wide. Like with the with the one that was start with Russell, he wasn't running right out to see mm. the track. This one, Gasly was running out to the gravel. Yeah, that's regardless true. of what was happening. So he's, he seems to be what what the misjudgment here, I think, is weirdly Gasly starts moving in the braking zone a bit weird and turns in a bit early, and then mm. has to self correct the turning, and maybe that causes the understeer. Like his turn is not one yeah. motion; it's like a little wiggle. Um, yeah, I, I would agree that that's more worthy of a an incident than the Russell one. Did he get a penalty for this one? Uh, yes, all oh, right. He did shortly after getting his penalty for track limits as well. Oh, oh we haven't God. mentioned that yet. No, I didn't want to because there was about forty-seven warnings and penalties for track limits this weekend. It was it was crazy. What annoyed me was there weren't enough. Sorry, Nick. Yeah, sorry. I was gonna say, I'm, I'm actually for the penalties. Same. I, I just think if they can't keep him in the track limits, then tough. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you because if you, oh, I'm all for better curbs, grass, and gravel as opposed to this weird fiasco that was going on. But if the rules are there, then you've got to enforce them. It's the fact that mm-hmm. it wasn't quite this strictly enforced elsewhere in the season, maybe. Yeah. And it stuck out like a sore thumb. The other thing, though, is when everybody, apart from Gasly, clearly, I don't know if there was anyone else that got an actual penalty from it, The oh, yeah, yeah, when everybody was. got to the end, all oh, right, certainly in the second half of the race, there was far fewer warnings, though, right? So clearly, something was working in terms of some drivers were able to change their style. Uh, I know Gasly got one, Lando got one, Joe got one. Right. Um, don't know if anyone else did. I don't think Joe did. I think he got one and then took it away again because it was a mistake. Ah, right. There was something about that after the race. Someone had got a penalty. I think it was Joe that they shouldn't have got a penalty. Not to take it off him. So even if I didn't know what was happening. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a bit of a mockery of it, isn't it? What frustrated me a bit was there was a lack of replays as to why or how or what corner. Yeah. Now, the only one I can remember was Hamilton getting a warning for the final mm-hmm. corner. And to mm. me, it wasn't four wheels off the track from that angle. No, I didn't think so either. I he paused was, it and was like, didn't go off. "There's the front right wheel looks like maybe part of it's on the line, but I if it if you wow, 
I thought it has to be like four wheels over it. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And, and from that touching, angle, yeah. from that angle, it did, from that replay, and maybe they, I don't know, you never know if they queue the wrong replay or something. True. I wouldn't have given that penalty, right? Because I don't, didn't look like that it was over the line. So I actually understood him blowing up on the radio. And But fair play, he managed to still be quick and adjust his line around that corner to definitely make sure. So that's a skill. But I know it's very different and it's... I'm not comparing this because of Hamilton versus Red Bull, but when the Red Bulls went over the pit lane exit at Monaco and didn't get a penalty, I thought that was a hard and fast, you can't have any part of your car over that line. Yeah. Whereas apparently you can. But now here, you don't have to have all the car off the track to get... Uh, it's weird. The whole thing's weird. I know it's not fair to compare those two incidents, but... Yeah, like you were saying earlier, Colin, the inconsistencies are a bit shambolic at the minute. It drives me mad, and it's just highlighting that you need the same race director every race, and you need the mm-hmm. same stewards every race. Mm-hmm. Or at least uh, one steward, that maybe like a head steward who goes to every race. Yeah, I mean, the, the argument people keep make, oh, it's a lot of travel and it's hard to work. Well, make it someone's full-time job. Yeah. If, if your full-time job is to travel Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday... Uh, 23 weekends a year that's your full time job pay them well and have the mm. same people doing the same things every week yeah that's been paid so, well enough that you do it for 5 years and retire yeah yeah, exactly you've got 2 race directors now who rotate and you've got about a pool of what like 25 30 stewards that are rotating and out mm-hmm. like it's, that's nonsense just get a set group of people and pay them well enough that it can be their full time job and they've got all those, uh, all this uh, audience figure money. That's not yeah. quite how it works, but no, because the sport is popular, so just, exactly. you'd hope there'd be extra sponsors and stuff. So it's annoying that in the pinnacle in motorsport, we're constantly talking about stewards and race directors. Yeah, that's a good point. It should be an example for all the series to lead off. Yeah, and at the moment, it's just a mess. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we comment we comment more on stewarding problems at this than we do at the touring cars. Yeah. yeah, and if anything, F one should be the most professional out of it out there. Yeah, and uh, and uh, oh, I just want to clarify that we sound once again like Hamilton apologies for picking up that one example, but that was the only replay I saw during the race about track limits. Could be wrong there. Don't know if you guys saw another one. No, I don't remember seeing anything else. So it's like, know. oh well, Gazi's got a penalty. Show me why. Hmm. Unless, of course, there's some excitement going on at the same time. They don't. But... <laughs> yeah. Let's not cut to Lance Stroll at Monaco again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just mentioned race directors. Michael Massey's left the FIA and he's went back to Australia. Yes. Has he got yes. a job in Australia, though? Uh, d- uh, he was exploring new opportunities, I think, mm. was the, the phrasing. So you might see him pop up at V8 Supercars or whatever else there is over there. That's the only thing I know about over there. So. <laughs> uh, that is the only big one. I mean, there's yeah. just, and, it, and you can't call it V8, Colin. It's just called is supercars. Not, is it not V8 uh, supercars? Uh, it's just called yeah. supercars, which I think is a huge mistake because it's not good for search engines because no. you're just going to get a picture of supercars. Oh, yeah. And uh, they've still got V8s. And it's what people have known it for 20 years, but, oh, 50, 10, 15 <laughs> years before. So just call it V8s and be done with it. Yeah, because the game was V8 supercars as well. It was. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I ever played that, but. That's what, that's how I remember the series is seeing that game. Out. Yeah, everyone. It changed a few years ago because I think, oh god, I think there was two reasons they wanted to sort of, oh, it's embarrassing and that we're still using V8s, and then also uh, Virgin Atlantic. I think paid for like the naming rights, so it was Virgin Supercars for the time, and now it's the Repco Supercars. I think, but either way, fuck, stick a V8 at the front of the name. Yeah. Everyone who knows it. <laughs> I digress. Yeah, so I think uh, he used to work there, didn't he? But I don't know yeah. if there's a role there at the minute. Um, we'll see. I will, I'll tell you what, I'll update you because I follow that series. <laughs> we can follow Michael Massey on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Massey Watch. Yeah. Hey. Massey Watch. <laughs> we should start selling sponsorship for our watches. <laughs> <laughs> so, back to the race. And Leclerc pits again, but gets past Max easily. Sainz is about to overtake Max to take second, and then his engine explodes. Literally explodes. Yes, plan A for explosion. (laughs) 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 
So uh, he pulls up the escape road, which unfortunately is on a hill. So mm. he's trying to climb out of a car that's burst into flames by all the things rolling back down the hill. Which, it was a mess, and they ended up, the FIA ended up cutting the feed away from it because it was, it was yeah. just messy. I don't think he knew his car was on fire till he'd stopped because if he did know that, you think he should have probably chucked it into the gravel to keep it still. Mm. Oh, yeah. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. Yeah. He's parked up near the fire marsh, hasn't he? Which maybe as well. That's another factor, isn't it? I don't know. It does make you wonder, though, why the F1 cars not necessarily have a handbrake but don't have a system that locks the wheels. A line lock. Yeah. Like a... A Ford Mustang has, if you want. Yeah. We'll drive. Or you press... just to put it in. I was going to say put it in gear, but you don't know how much no. the gearbox went out the back of the car when it blew up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think a line lock somehow applies the brakes to the front at the front. Mm. For, um, Ford, all I know is a Ford Mustang is a real drive sports car for the road. You can put line lock on, then you mash the throttle and it just spins up the rear tires and does a burnout while it's stationary. Mm-hmm. So therefore, the front wheels are locked up. A real, a real um, 2022 feature, that. Very on trend, mm. not. <laughs> yeah. F1 cars do use the front brakes predominantly as well, so mm. that would make sense. Because yeah. the rear brakes are to do with the uh, harvesting, aren't they? Now, the only, thing, the only reason that something that, that would come into play is if it's a regulation to have it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because of the complexity and weight, blah, 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 blah. And this is a strange example, but it, it would make a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean... It, it's one of those things. It's probably not going to happen again. But you sh- you can't be in a situation where a driver can't get out of his burning car because then the car's going to roll backwards into mm. other cars. And there are other circuits with elevation. Imagine mm. if it happened at the f- up to the first corner at Cota. Yeah. Yeah, I, I felt sorry not for coming him down when he was trying to actually. You could see him letting the brake off and thinking, uh, "I can't get out. I can. I need to." <laughs> yeah. It was weird. And it sort of uh, it ended up rolling back anyway, didn't it? Even with the trucks under the front wheel, just didn't the marshal wasn't quite there. Not blaming them; they were running from wherever they oh, were, yeah. with, with, and they had that with them. So the foresight mm-hmm. was there, but it still ended yeah. up in the barrier, didn't it? I think. I think science said that he'd already made the decision at that point. I'm getting out of this car now. I have to. And if he'd have waited just a tiny bit longer, they would have got the chuck under the wheel. But he just jumped out as yeah. they were trying to put but it the, under. The, in the slow-mo shot, he's almost engulfed in flames at that point. Oh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying he should have waited. <laughs> Same. He waited longer than he probably should have to get out. Yeah, I'm not blaming him for yeah. running out with that. I would. It was a spectacular so that... explosion, though, wasn't it? Seeing all the bits mm. flying out the side of the car. Yeah, that pretty much screws any hope of him having the title challenge because he's going to end up with all the penalties now. Yeah. At some point in the season. So that brought the seat via C, which then Max and Leclerc both pitted under. Mm-hmm. Russell then on restart manages to get Ocon for fourth, but Charles Leclerc then starts having throttle problems, which must be worrying when your teammate's car is just burnt to a crisp outside the road. Yeah. Well, just throttle problems in general. It's got to be scary, but I think they said it was 30% throttle it was locked at. Hmm. Um, yeah. Or thirty percent when he takes his foot off the throttle, it was only going back to thirty percent off, and that's got to be scary, isn't it? Yeah, he said he was struggling most at turn three, mm. but Martin Brundle made a good, decent point. It's like you shouldn't be talking about that on radio because the FIA might just pull you in mm-hmm. for safety reasons. But um, he managed to nurse at home. Max wasn't catching him for ages, and then they cleared the traffic, and all of a sudden. As he was crossing the line, I think it was down to about 1.3, 1.4. Mm-hmm. So another lap and Max would have won that race. Well, maybe. You don't know how much Charles is extra, extra backing off. Hmm. Yeah. But you're right. Worrying times. Another reliability issue for a Ferrari there. Yeah. When it was supposed to be 37 this weekend, the Paul Ricard, there was no way their cars were surviving that. <laughs> 32, maybe. But the Ferrari think they've found some upgrades as well on their engine, which will put it on performance par with Red Bull. But the mm. performance isn't the issue here; it's they keep blowing up. They're going to have no chance the second half of the season if they don't get on top of that somehow over the summer break. Yeah. Did you see the Alonso thing as well, where he was uh, in the investigation? Ah, this is what I was going to mention. Yeah. Crafty, <laughs> crafty yes. that is. What did he do? Tom. So Alonso pits. 
new uh-huh. tires go on. It comes out. The front left wheel's loose. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, is it loose or is it? Uh, anyway, I'll come to that. So he doesn't say on the radio, oh, front left wheel's falling off. He just goes, box again or pit again. And they're like, yeah? Why? <laughs> yeah. And he goes, pit again. And they're like, uh, sure. <laughs> and then he comes in, puts on the new tyres and goes out again. So the theory being that if he actually said, oh, the front left wheel's loose, that's a penalty. Uh, potentially an unsafe release as well. Yeah. So it's all very clever for the foresight, but very crafty at the same time. Anyway, he escaped the penalty. Uh, because of... T- well, it's not really clear why. Have you well, seen why? Sort of. They have said that the wheel was attached properly when he left the pits. Correct. Um, and that it broke on pit exit. And mm. they, they seem to be implying that there was either a problem with the tyre or the wheel itself, not yeah. the fitting of it. Correct. But um, I can't help but yeah. think that the radio message has saved his bacon there. Yeah. And if that's true, then f- bravo. It's Alonso, isn't it? Yeah. Like we're saying, but I don't know. Because the, the, the statement from the stewards talks about on the video, there's nothing to indicate that the pit stop went wrong. Um, nothing appears to be wrong before turn three, which is just out of the pit lane. It's the first. It's the first corner he'll come to after the pit lane because turn yeah. two is that kink. Shortly after turn three, the driver on the radio state, uh, states that they will need to box again. When asked by the crew, the driver simply reported that they needed to box again. So that's part of the stewards' yeah. statement as to why it's not a penalty. Therefore, in my opinion, it's a factor. <laughs> so I'm wondering if there's a rule in there on the in the. Are the wording of the rules, which meant they couldn't really, even though it's I, weird. I don't know. I just thought it was brilliant, especially the the fact that they specifically asked him, "Is there a problem?" And he's just like, "Well, yeah, but I'm not going to tell you." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just <laughs> box again. I mean, I mean, clearly it's a grey area in the rules, and he's deliberately mm. exploiting that. Therefore, it's clever. Yeah, yeah. But and also maybe well done it, to the team just for actually listening just, to him and going along with it instead of just saying, "Well, no." <laughs> What's the problem? <laughs> yeah, because he could have just come in and they wouldn't have had. They might not have had new tires. Yeah, that's the weird part about it. But they yeah, can't be that one. Slapped on a new set, didn't they? So, well, it might yeah, be a new set. One. And it was coaching uh, Yuki Tsunoda during the race as well. Oh yes, it was, was what? Brilliant. Sorry, <laughs> he, he tries. He tries to get around the uh, right hand side between turn three and four on the straight, and Tsunoda squeezes him onto the grass. And oh, as they're yeah. going into breaking zone, <laughs> as they're breaking, <laughs> he's alongside and he's giving them a finger wag as they're under breaking. Yeah. They tell them, no, you shouldn't be doing that. So uh, all the time yeah. you leave the space. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So uh, yeah, he managed to coach UK and UK. I think posted afterwards on Instagram a thumbs up saying he's going to learn. But it wouldn't be like Fernando to put someone else in the grass. So oh yeah. No, he doesn't do that. No. So wasn't it Fernando who put Vettel on the grass or on the outside of Monza, or was it the other way around? I think they did it to each other. Yeah, if I remember correctly, two years in a row. Mm. So I think they both had a go. Yeah, he's lost none of his um, guile, entertainment factor. <laughs> no, no. But yeah, guile was a better word. <laughs> so, Ferrari. For quite one race, Verstappen was second with fastest lap, Hamilton third to pick up, I think, his fourth podium in the season, mm. and Russell managed to fight back to fourth. Brilliant drive from Russell there with the penalty and the front nose cone change. Yeah. Mm. Very good. And double points for Haas and McLaren as well. Can I just um, ask about Haas? Mm. Is this a resurgence or is it two tracks in a row that suit them? I think it's tracks. I think they've said they'll bring one more update to Hungary, and then that's yeah. it for the wow, year. Wow, who? Why? <laughs> to, get, to get ready for next year. Yeah. Oh, they've written off the year already, then basically. I think everyone is McLaren. I think I've turned to next year. Well, yeah. that makes sense for them, but Alpine as well. Yeah, Alonso was saying. I think at the weekend, they're... Alpine should do the same, and I think they are. Well, it's interesting. Altmar keeps talking like he's not a big fan of Alonso. So, yeah. but it's be cool to see if Piastri gets that scene next year or if Fernando's got enough sway so he 
keeps his seat. Oh, Fernando's think... staying there. Come on. I don't think Otmar's a fan of him, by the way he speaks Yeah, about. because Fernando basically runs a team. Yeah. And it undermines Otmar. I mean, that's what happens with Fernando in the team. It's just how he operates. Hmm. Yeah. But it was double points as well for Alpine. Yeah, the FIA is introducing slightly new rules for next year, isn't it? And to do with the aerodynamics to try and stop the porpoising, which I think mm-hmm. is also affecting the teams moving over to next year. So oh, they're going to make changes to the diffuser, and until they know exactly what those changes are, it, they can't really work on the designs because it will affect everything. Fair enough. So, sorry, Paul Ricard this weekend, and also not kill. So, one series goes into summer break and the BTCC is back. Mm. Happy days. Not kill? But... Yay, Paul Ricard. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm intrigued with Paul Ricard because all the talk is that Mercedes are going to be strong and Nick DeVries is subbing in for Lewis Hamilton on Friday. Yeah. Oh, that's so, cool. So, it'll be a nice little twist to see how he does. Mm-hmm. Does. Um, and if Mercedes are as strong as they should be, or supposed to be, then this will be a really fun race. We might have six cars battling. I'm not believing the hype. No, <laughs> you I never, hope so, you, but... you never do, do you? Nope. <laughs> but yeah, not kill. Cool. I'm really excited for that. Mm. Will the Michael... option tire return? Well, yeah, on you go, Tom. <laughs> no, I, I... Touring Car Times had the uh, this article about Ash Sutton because the, recently there was a two day. Annual Goodyear tyre test at Snetterton. <laughs> and Ashton was like, oh, pretty much our whole day was based around t- testing out the option tyre. Which is the softer tyre, which remember, um, I think last year, but not the COVID year. And then the year before that, we had at least mm-hmm. some rounds where within that three race weekend, you had to use a soft tyre at least once. Yeah. yeah. Is that it? And uh, we all decried that and weren't a fan because it was too fake. Now, mm-hmm. interestingly, we've got this season where it's like the purest form of BTCC where the person on pole wins. Uh, if you win race one, you've got a good chance of winning race two because it, the hybrid doesn't have a good effect or a significant effect as the balance did. And so are they considering bringing back this whole tag compound nonsense? That's my concern. I hope not. But why would they well, test it otherwise? Yeah, I'm a bit more open to it, seeing the race in this year than I was in previous years. But still, Yeah, I'm with you. I'm not... I'm still not convinced it needs it yet. I, I don't want it. No. <sighs> no, thanks. I think they can make tweaks to the hybrid system to help. Exactly. More than bringing back the uh, the tyres. But I think we've discussed it before. I think that's the logical thing from the outside, but it might be that what they deploy now in the hybrid system is the maximum it can deliver, and therefore they can't really do anything with it, if that makes sense. Yes, but it, it is something that could be developed, is what I mean. Um, oh, not yeah. necessarily for this season, or even maybe next season, but the season after that. Yeah, I agree. Because it is a new technology, at least in the, the terms of the touring cars. Yeah. Could could you artificially increase the hybrid effectiveness by just throttling back the natural power of the cars? I mean, oh, the right. So natural, a bit slower, yeah, but they, so the true. hybrid then gives you a bit more of a boost. I don't know how you do that. I'm not that kind of engineer. Sure. But... but speaking of that, one thing we need to listen out for and not read, unfortunately, is uh, if there's going to be a boost change for the M Spot engines again going into this weekend. Uh, yes. Because uh, certainly BTC were struggling at Croft. Mm-hmm. But it's always hard to know if it's a car thing or them. But I don't think any of yes. the Tucker engines were up there. I think Rory Butcher was the best, wasn't he? And he was sort of. Up in the top 10, but nothing spectacular. So I suspect that's been going on, and maybe that Snetterton test was used to look at the data. I don't know. Mm. We should say that the technical director, Peter Riches, is it? He's stepping down. Oh, is he? And his son, I've uh, forgotten his name, Sam Riches, is taking over at the end of this season. So these sort of big decisions are up to him. I assume, yeah. obviously, Mister Gow as well, but he has to balance all the complaints and decide what's best. So, not a, not an easy job. Oh, and the one final thing I was going to mention about BTCC, unrelated, but did you see Rich Energy was up to its games again? Oh yeah, no. yeah. It's sending the sponsorship with some motorbike teams. So the championship leading British superbike bike team 
has just <sighs> lost its title sponsor, Rich Energy, midway through the season. Uh, that company, yeah. man. So I'm assuming that BTC Racing's getting a little bit nervous. We'll have to, yeah, we'll have to see. We'll have to see what they turn up with this weekend. Uh, pure speculation there, but it's not ideal, is it? And then uh, the other thing was Rocket, or Rocket, I don't even know how you sponsor, uh, pronounce that sponsor, <clears throat> or what they really do. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, 3D no. mobile phones and electric mo- motorcycles? Mm, all right, sure. I don't think that gives you enough money to sponsor all these race teams. Anyway, they sponsor Tatiana Calderon in IndyCar, except mm. they stopped her mid-season as well. Ah. So we're going to have to keep our eyes out for BTC Racing and uh, Jay Kill's car at the weekend, see if those deals are still honoured. Well, yeah, and Rocket is pretty much his main sponsor, isn't it? That's pretty much all you see on the car. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. But, I mean, with both, there could be additional context we're not aware of yet behind the scenes. Yeah. They might not have got on with William's story. (laughs) Surely not. (laughs) I have never seen a can of it, Jerry, in person in my life. You could. Uh, only three people have. <laughs> I think you can only buy it direct off their website. Matt Neal had one once, didn't he, on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it doesn't really count, though, does it? Seen in the way of, no, not really. I think you could buy if it I from do, Amazon at one point. If I do go to Not Kill this weekend, I'll be looking out for Rich Energy. Yeah. See if there's anyone, anyone selling any cans. There is a, a book coming out about um, their shenanigans in motorsport, actually. Uh, next month, it's called Racing with Rich Energy, colon, How a Rogue Sponsor Took Formula 1 for a Ride. Ugh. It's by Elizabeth Blackstock mm. and Alanis King. I've got it pre-ordered. Nice. Although it's <laughs> £30 at the minute, so it better be massive and full of pictures. Yeah. Ouch. But I think, must be private or published then. Uh, well, I actually think it is published, but maybe only in America, and this might be an import or something weird. Yeah. Uh. But it is due for the 23rd of August, and I, I listened to a podcast with... Uh, one of the authors, and I thought it was quite interesting how they've got quotes from people and stuff like this. It's mainly about the Haas deal that fell through. Yeah. They can't even make their own juice properly. Yeah. <laughs> going to sponsor a team. Exactly. Exactly. Don't take red charities money, I think, might be the moral, mm. but we're not lawyers, so... Also, yeah. we don't have a race team that has no sponsor and they come along. So, no, but yeah. if Rich Energy do wish to sponsor this podcast, then feel <laughs> free to let us know. <laughs> yeah. We do have many segments available for sponsorship. Or oh, poor energy, even. You know, we're hey. not, we're not going to quibble. <laughs> no, no, no. So, Paul Ricard this weekend. We'll be back next week with that, and of course, not kill. Yeah. So, any, any more for you guys? Oh yeah, can I ramble for two minutes, please? <laughs> uh, Nick Tandy tested the. Napa Racing Ford during the tyre test at the BTCC car. It was a third Napa branded car, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. And he is the 2015 24 Hour of Le Mans race winner for Porsche overall. Now then, one of his teammates was Earl Bamba. Could either of you name his other? <laughs> no. Nick Highfield. Oh, you're close. You're so close. <laughs> was it Nico? Yes, Nico Hulkenberg. How was it? So he, Super sub himself. Yeah, so he, yeah, weird how he's won Le Mans before finishing Formula One career. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so Nick Tandy won Le Mans with him, and he was testing the uh, Napa car. He previously tested a motor based Ford a few years ago, I think. So yeah. I don't know what the story was there. I haven't seen any quotes afterwards. He's still currently a paid Corvette driver in WC but the weird thing there is that category of car is defunct after this season so maybe he's looking at other options who knows yeah Uh, it was mostly interesting that there was just a third Napa Ford exactly not that he was in one of the other cars no it didn't have to be branded right yeah it's a test there's no footage Mm. but there it was full liveried up who knows I don't think he'll be coming to the, the championship personally but Looks like they're trying to get a third, maybe for next season a third car in that team. I think it could be that. What I would love to see, which I'm not sure about, is in supercars, not V8, Colin. <laughs> they have this thing called the wild card system, where um, single car entries can be 
participants for like a certain number of rounds in the year. So like, mm. if there's an up and coming driver who finds extra sponsorship budget in, and he's racing in like Super Two, one of the sport categories, he can do like one or two races in the main game. Uh, or if there's like a driver and they're doing like the Bathurst endurance race and they want to get some extra mileage or something, they can enter. And what I'd love to see is like towards the end of the season, if they're in championship contention, they enter like a third car for like the final two rounds to help out the rivals a bit. Mm. I, I I know it's a bit skullduggery, but I really like it when teams do that for some reason. I don't know why. Because I think, was it uh, 2007 in the Vauxhall team, they brought Alan Menu back for a round and Seat had mm. Tom Coronel. Mm. And then, um, oh, it might have been 2009 in Collins' year when he was in the RSC car. They brought Anthony Reed back in the BMW for a few rounds as well. <laughs> it didn't really do much, but just to see an extra car on the grid that's sort of a bit rogue is quite fascinating. Yeah, well, they, they kind of did that. Was it not last year, the year before when um, Power Max were not really on the grid, but they had their car out for a different driver? Oh, there, yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm. Just something like that would be quite interesting because that's how yeah. we got to see was it, uh, Jade Edwards first and Jess Hawkins, Jack yep. Constable. I can't remember the other ones now, but there was... Bushell was in there, was he? Yes, I've got a funny feeling that he broke down and didn't actually take part in the race. Or was that... No, that was Jack Constable, I think. Actually. Didn't Bushell get injured and not killed? Hmm. Oh, we should probably wrap this podcast up before we uh, yeah, get that wrong. Yeah, we ramble more, but yeah. No, you're right. the idea, but... though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, sorry. Let's go. <laughs> right. We'll see you in five this weekend. And then uh, we're back next week. So, goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.